Okay. Um, everyone, I'd like to um, give you a warm welcome uh, this evening to the Queensland Climate Update for this year, 2021. Uh, my name is Rebecca Pierce. I'm uh, here on Ngunnawal land at the Australian National University. I'm a lecturer in the Fenner School of Environment and Society and also the School of Sociology. Uh, and I'll be your moderator for the evening. Um, so to begin, I want to pay my respects uh, to the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional co custodians of the land um, from which I'm speaking to you today and to pay respect to the elders of the Ngunnawal nation, both past, present and emerging. And I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in attendance today um, and acknowledge their sovereignty was never ceded. We have a really excellent lineup of presenters for you uh, this evening at um, uh, the Queensland edition of this um, climate update series. Um, a little bit about the series. So the event is organised as a collaboration but, um, with the University of Queensland Faculty of Science and, um, and here we're working from the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions. So on behalf of the team at ANU, I want to thank um, our UQ science team for their wonderful work in helping to organise um, tonight's event and in due course you'll be meeting your speakers. Before we get to that, however, um, just some uh, administration um, notes uh, for our audience. So uh, you'll be able to submit questions um, anytime into the Q&A dialog box that you'll find at the bottom of the Zoom window. I'm pretty sure by now we're all familiar with that. Um, you'll also be able to vote um, for other people's questions by clicking the thumbs up beside any questions that you might see in the Q&A um, box that, um, uh, that you're also interested in. Um, so in the discussion after the presentations, I will put as many of the questions um, that rise to the top by popular vote as we have time for um, to the panel um, according to this interesting voting system that we have. I should also announce that we're recording. Uh, so for the benefit of those who can't join us live tonight, um, uh, uh, all the presentations will be recorded. Uh, and that also means that the comments and questions in the Q&A will be recorded. Um, so on that note, let's begin. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker tonight, my colleague, Professor Mark Howden. Mark is the director of the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions. He's also an honorary professor at the University of Melbourne, a vice chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change from which he's just um, arrived uh, from a meeting, um, part of their work. And he's also a member of the Australian National Climate Science Advisory Committee. Mark has worked um, in a number of important areas on climate variability, climate change, innovation and adaptation issues over the last 30 years, working in partnership with many industry, community and policy groups, um, doing research and working at um, what we call the science policy interface. So thank you, Mark. Um, looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, thanks very much, Beck, for that introduction and for, for hosting uh, the meeting today. And, and I'd also like to thank uh, University of Queensland uh, for uh, co-designing, um, uh, co-creating and, and running this meeting. Uh, so it's, it's really good to work with you, um, Ove and Justine and others. So I'm going to give a quick rundown of uh, um, sort of the latest science and climate change and the latest information. And so I'll just load up my screen. Hopefully this will work. And um, so, Beck, is there a full screen there? Sure is. Okay, and did it move? It did. Fantastic. So, <laughs> on our way. Okay. So, so what I'm just talking about is is a progress in terms of of the science and data, um, and uh, and and change in the real world. Last year in 2020. 
And of course, as we know, this was a pretty horrendous year for many Australians and many people around the world with climate disruptions of many different types loading onto um, the COVID disruptions that we we're already experiencing. And so the first thing I'd want to point out is that um, last year, emissions actually went down for the first time since the global financial crisis. So if we actually look at this graph of, of carbon dioxide emissions going back uh, you know, to the 1990s, uh, at that stage we were producing about 22 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, it went up to the high 30s, uh, going back just before COVID, uh, and COVID drove, drove that down roughly 7% globally, about 3 or 4% nationally. And, and, that, and that's a big change, um, but ultimately it makes very little difference to climate change unless we continue that trajectory downwards. So to solve climate change, it's not a matter of just levelling out this curve at, say, 36 billion tonnes a year or 34 billion, whatever it might be, um, because that actually commits us to future climate changes I'll talk about later. And the reason is that for every one of these billions of tonnes of carbon dioxide that, that's emitted, roughly speaking, a quarter gets absorbed by the oceans, a quarter gets absorbed by the land, the vegetation, and half of it stays in the atmosphere and it'll stay there for hundreds, possibly even a thousand years. So that means roughly half of our emissions, roughly 20 billion tonnes, will accumulate in the atmosphere, adding to the previous year's 20 billion tonnes and the previous year's 20 billion tonnes, etc. And that's why to solve climate change, we first have to take carbon dioxide down close to net zero or possibly even below zero. And that's a really crucial difference to what a lot of people conceive about this. And that's why net zero is the thing that many governments and businesses are talking about at the moment, because that's what's needed to solve climate change. Now, given that we've um, been producing those greenhouse gases for a long time, we've accumulated lots of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. When I was born, the concentration was 317 parts per million. It's now 417. We've also got record levels of methane and other greenhouse gases like nitrous oxide. Uh, and, and this accumulatively adds to the greenhouse gas burden that we're placing on the atmosphere and placing on the earth. So all of these greenhouse gases act in a way that it lets heat from the sun through, but it traps some of the heat which is coming back from earth. And so it stick, keeps that heat in against the earth instead of letting that escape out to space. And the more of these greenhouse gases we have, the more of that heat is trapped in against the earth. So that's the basics of uh, climate change. And we've known about that basic climate change story for well over 150 years now. So we've, this is not new science, this is old science. And when we actually start to look at what's happened in temperature, it's not surprising that given we're pumping out billions of tonnes of greenhouse gases a year, we're increasing the global temperature. And this is a, a record of temperatures going back to 1850 or so, up to last year. And we can see that there's been a sustained period of increase, particularly in the last four or so decades. Last year um, was the equal hottest on record, equaling 2016. If it didn't happen to be a La Nina last year, which cools the earth, it actually acts to drive down global temperatures, it probably would have been another record year. And that was about 1.24 degrees above the long-term average in the pre-industrial numbers. And just to put this in context, because 1.24 doesn't sound like much, but the difference in temperature, global temperature, between the last ice age and our historical temperatures is around about five degrees. So 1.24 degrees is like a quarter of an ice age, but in the opposite direction. And remember, ice ages fundamentally change the face of the earth. So this is a really big deal when we say 1.24, even though it doesn't sound like much. Here in Australia last year was the fourth warmest on record. Um, in New South Wales and Queensland, um, they, were, they were reasonably warm as well. If we look at the um, graph uh, across the globe, we can see that that warming occurred pretty much everywhere with the exception of a little patch down near Antarctica. Some places were extraordinarily warm, uh, such as in Siberia. And so that generated news headlines, um, you know, record temperatures in, in the Arctic Circle resulting in big fires, um, melting of permafrost, melting of snow, um, and, and sea ice in that region. Uh, so really significant impacts. And we can just see from that graph, that figure, just how pervasive this is. It truly is a global issue. 
as we'll all, all remember, Black Summer um, was a horrendous uh, experience for many people and for many of our creatures on our Australia's land. Um, something like about 8 million Australians were affected, 34 lives lost directly, about 400 people died of conditions worsened by smoke. Over 2,500 2, homes were destroyed in about the same number of other buildings, leading to immense cost, the biggest uh, disaster in Australia's history in financial terms. Huge numbers of wild animals are dead, essentially uncountable, um, ra estimates ranging up to 3 billion. About 18.5 million hectares were burnt. Some of them still aren't recovering, in spite of the fact that Australia's bush generally is actually evolved to recover from fires. And that 18.5 million hectares is bigger than many European countries. That's the scale at which we're dealing with. And sitting in amongst this was a clear fingerprint of climate change in terms of the, clear, um, the key drivers of fires, which include temperature, um, wind gusts, uh, and uh, dry, hum um, dry air, the relative humidity is low. And if we actually compare that experience this time last year versus what we're experiencing now, it just shows you how sensitive we remain in terms of climate and climate drivers. Such a chalk and cheese experience, and that's the difference a La Nina makes. And unfortunately, those extremes are getting worse globally, and the more we know about these extremes and the more we record what's going on globally, the worse the picture becomes. And this is the core theme of what I'm talking about. The more we know, the worse it looks. If we look at sea levels, um, that also was our record levels of sea, um, sea level um, across the globe. Um, it's going up something like 3.6 millimetres a year at the moment. So it's accelerating. It's going up faster and faster over time. And particularly that's being driven by the breakdown of the Greenland ice sheets, which are actually um, breaking down um, much faster than was anticipated even a few years ago. So that's accelerating and that's driving, principally driving those sea level rise. But also we're starting to see West um, Antarctica breakdown and even East Antarctica breakdown, which we thought was pretty much safe for many, many decades to come. And the seas keep getting hotter. So most of the excess heat that the Earth is absorbing goes into the oceans. And we can see that different estimates of this show that the global ocean heat content just keeps going up and up and up. And that heat is generating more extreme events over the oceans as well as over the land. So we're getting more and stronger cyclones. So across the globe, we're getting more cyclones on average. And of those cyclones, more of them are the category three, four and five ones, the really nasty ones. So that's what this graph shows, is that the proportion of the total number of cyclones, which are category three, four or five. So if you go back to 1980, globally around about a third of cyclones within that category, now we're up almost to 40%. And that same pattern is occurring around the oceans around Australia, the Southern Indian Ocean and the South Pacific Ocean, which is against Queensland, of course. We also see um, high sensitivity to climate change. So our estimates of how much the earth will warm given a particular amount of greenhouse gas emissions have gone up. So previous estimates of what we call the climate sensitivity to doubling of carbon dioxide were 1.5 to 4.5. And those have been recently re-evaluated to 2.3 to 4.5. So it's the lower end of the scale which has gone up. And this reduced range, which means there's more certainty about what's going to happen, is consistent with paleo and historical evidence. Now, what this means in practice is that some people might have had a hope that we could have had emissions of scenar emission scenarios which were high emission scenarios but giving us low levels of climate change. Unfortunately, those no longer seem to be likely. And at the same time, we can't rule out the higher end values, higher emissions and high levels of climate change. So the whole risk profile has shifted to the worser end of the scale. And our best estimate of when we're going to achieve 1.5 degrees, so cross over that 1.5 degrees threshold, has been brought forward by about 10 years since even as little recently as the last IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees, which had that roughly happening around about 2040. Now it's likely to be in the early 2030s. And there's a one in four chance estimated by the WMO, the World Meteorological Office, that 1.5 degrees is going to be exceeded globally at least once in the next four years. So again, 
the more we find out about these things, the worse it becomes. And in particular, Queensland, a recent study in Queensland shows how much worse heat waves are likely to get. So this is a, um, a study which showed um, the difference between 1.5 degrees, which is the green blob on that figure, um, the orange one, which is two degrees, and three degrees, which is the red sort of blob at the top. And when, once we get to three degrees, what we're likely to see is on average something like about seven heat wave events happening in Queensland, each of which is a duration of 15 plus days. So in other words, something like 100 days of heat waves on average in Queensland, likely to impact hugely on pretty much everything you do there. And of course, it's not just happening in Australia, um, but right across the globe, people are seriously exposed to heat stress and particularly around the equatorial to subtropical regions of the globe, um, there's likely to be high frequencies of what's called deadly heat stress days. Ones where people can't safely go outside and do light exercise or work and stay homeothermics, keep their body temperature within the safe range. And of course, drought is a perennial problem for Australia, but it's likely to become a perennial problem for many parts of the world. So we can see in this very recent study that Australia is likely to become a hotspot for increasing drought, along with parts of the Mediterranean, North Africa, and South America, and parts of North America. And of course, this is um, happening because we've got that combination of higher temperatures, lower rainfall in southwest and southeast Australia, um, and increased dryness of the air, the vapour pressure deficit, which is going up. So droughts are likely to get worse. And moving from that global picture down to an Australian picture, this is, a, again, a recent study from last year, which shows in this particular case um, extreme drought and the percentage of time that we're likely to be in extreme drought. Each of the coloured bars is a different region in Australia, R for rangelands, N for northern Australia, S for southern Australia, and EA for eastern Australia. And you can see for those different time frames, um, going up in 20-year blocks up to the end of the century, consistently over every region in Australia, over time, drought gets worse and worse until towards the end of the century, we're having extreme drought conditions, an average of, according to these scenarios, about 50% of the time. So that's a, a scenario which should send shivers down your spine. This is a future we don't want to go near. And of course, the same happens in terms of water. Um, we see the southern parts of Australia drying out. Not the driest trend across the globe, because that's over in South Africa, or South America, but nevertheless, significant trends to drying um, across the Murray-Darling Basin and um, southern catchments in the southwest, complementing exactly what we're seeing right now, consistent with that. And in terms of sea level rise, again, the more we find out, the worse it looks. So even if we go back just a few years, 2014 to the fifth assessment, that's the AR5 on this, what we see is the estimated sea level rise for any given temperature increase um, is relatively low compared with our estimates now. So that AR5 estimate is from 2014, the SROC estimate is from the last uh, 2019, and the, the line, the straight um, solid line with the dashes around it is the most recent estimate. And so you can see, say, if we look at, say, 1.5 degrees in the fifth assessment report, AR5, that would give you something like about half a metre of sea level rise per century on average. That has gone up to well um, about 0.75, um, you know, three quarters of a metre of sea level rise per century at that same temperature. So, so our estimates of sea level rise for a given temperature are just getting worse and worse. And the, the coloured bars, the vertical ones with the dot in the middle, are expert assessments, which include a range of processes, which the quantitative models which are used to make these estimates don't include. So that sea level rise is likely to keep on going up. And of course, this and other things are likely to hit hard economically, as well as in terms of our social interactions, our environment, biodiversity management. And so this estimate of economic impact from the Reserve Bank indicates up to a quarter of our GDP lost by the end of the century unless we take action on climate change. And of course, that comes, that and those numbers just keep on going bigger and bigger as we both understand more about climate change and the impacts of climate change and the limitations to adaptation, but also as our economic analysis methods improve. 
Now, of course, one solution to dealing with this is basically stop looking, stop doing the science. Um, and really bizarrely, but unfortunately, this was exactly the argument that was used last year in the US. If you're finding too many coronavirus cases when you test, stop the testing. And if you translate that to climate change, if climate change looks like it's getting worse and worse, stop doing the science. And that would be a terrible thing because I just simply don't see that as a way to move in an informed and equitable way for Australia. So luckily in Australia, we actually have an incredibly informed populace. So this is from the Lowy Institute poll, which has been taken over many years, and it asks people about their attitudes to climate change. And when you actually look at the top two categories, they add up to 90%, consistently 90% of Australians say that they want more action on climate change. So the public demand for action on climate change remains incredibly strong. Very, very few other topics would have that level of public support. But at the moment, we're not getting that much political action, even though some of the states are moving much faster than they were a few years ago. So as it stands, we're unlikely to achieve the Paris Agreement goals, which is keep the temperatures well below two degrees and if possible to 1.5. On current trends in terms of global emissions, the probability of staying below two degrees of warming is only one in 20. There's a one in 20 chance of staying below two if we keep on doing what we're doing. However, if all countries met their nationally determined contributions, Australia's 26 to 28% reduction, by 2030, and then continued to reduce, reduce those emissions at the same rate in a linear way after 2030, then the chance of staying below two degrees rises to basically 26%, one in four chance. Just reflect that. If we keep on doing what, we, what we're supposed to do and keep it going, so reduce our emissions substantially, we've still only got a one in four chance of staying below two degrees. So consequently, many analyses have said that countries must ramp up their climate pledges hugely to actually achieve the Paris Agreement temperature targets. Now, the last component of what I'm talking about today is just introducing the carbon budget approach to you. So this is a, a, a really simple um, policy tool to assess um, how greenhouse gas emissions out into the future relate to temperature change, temperature increases. Now, if you remember back to the first few slides, how I described how carbon dioxide accumulates over time. So this year's excess adds to last year's excess, et cetera. So we can add up the, that accumulative carbon dioxide emissions from any particular time. And what we do is we find that there's a linear relationship between those carbon dioxide um, emissions and temperature increases. Well, it's actually slightly non-linear, but not enough to worry about. And so that means in a very simplistic way, it means that for any given cumulative carbon dioxide emission quantity, we can say what the temperature increase is going to be across the globe. But it's not quite that simple. We have to do a couple of things first. Firstly, we already have some temperature increase locked in due to past greenhouse gas emissions. So that reduces our effective temperature. Secondly, there's a whole series of non-carbon dioxide gases like methane and nitrous oxide which also need to be included. So again, that reduces the effective temperature. So when we actually do the intersection of the bottom dotted line um, and take a vertical drop, it tells us for a given temperature goal, like two degrees, what roughly speaking, our cumulative carbon dioxide emissions need to be. But before we can come to that conclusion, we have to take one extra step. And that is what we call earth system feedbacks. So when we warm the earth, we can set in train um, processes that release more greenhouse gases which warm the earth further. So for example, if you're thinking of permafrost, when we warm the permafrost, that releases carbon dioxide from microbial activity and also methane, which warms the earth further, which warms the permafrost so it melts more. So that's an earth system feedback. So when we take those earth system feedbacks off that carbon budget, that gives us our remaining carbon budget that's consistent with any particular temperature goal. And when we do those numbers, it says that we've, roughly speaking, we've got about 390 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide still in our budget to spend to have a 50-50 chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial. Unfortunately, though, our current emissions, when we include land use change and those fossil fuel emissions I showed you earlier, 
the, our total carbon dioxide emissions are about 42 gigatons per year. So if you do the simple math, 390 by 40, divided by 42, that means at current rates of emissions, if we keep on doing what we're doing, that gives us about nine and a half years before we run out of our budget that's consistent with 1.5 degrees. And at that point, if we want to stay at 1.5 degrees, we've got to go to net zero, which would be a huge shock to the economy, one which would not be sustainable. And if we actually think about that dip in emissions from COVID, the six or seven percent that we had last year, that makes almost no difference to that end point, reaching that end point. In fact, it makes about three and a half weeks later that we reach that end point of running out of our budget that's consistent with 1.5 degrees. Now, of course, if we expand it to two degrees, which is the, in a sense, the main Paris Agreement goal, um, our numbers expand. So we have about 27 years of, of leeway there. Um, before we have to go cold turkey to net zero. But the key message here is that every year we delay substantial emission reductions makes the job harder, it makes the job riskier, and it makes the job more expensive. So early action really matters. And so we, when we put this into policy operation, oftentimes we're hearing in the, in the debate about time to net zero, we'll reach net zero in 2050 or preferably by 2050 or some countries and jurisdictions have net zero by 2045 targets. And that's all well and good, um, but it's not only a function of when you in reach net zero, it's also what you do in the meantime that's crucial. So if we keep on emitting as we are, we actually run out of time to net zero very quickly and we have to bring that net zero date forward. So if we keep on emitting at a high rate and net zero has to creep in from 2050 to 2045 or 2040. And vice versa, if we actually have action now, substantial action now, that pushes out the net zero date and gives us more time to adjust. So the key message here is that net zero is a necessary but a not sufficient condition to meet the Paris Agreement goals. We have to have both net zero targets and matching interim targets to avoid climate change. So if you hear a politician who only talks about net zero, you should know that you're having the wool pulled over your eyes. They should be talking about net zero and interim targets. And to do this is not trivial. And to do this is really important if you think back to those scenarios of the grim future of Australia if we keep letting rip with climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. So this is not a vanity project. This is not a competition to beat your chest about who can get to net zero first. This is crucial. This is crucial for our economy, our society, our environment. And it's increasingly clear for every analysis that I've seen that early action is much, much less costly than later action. That action is much less costly than inaction. So the key messages from our talk is there is increasing and accumulating evidence of climate change and its impacts. And unfortunately, the news arising from that is not good. It looks worse and worse the more we know. Rapid and substantial action is needed to avoid the worst case scenarios in the future and is hugely publicly supported in Australia. And lastly, greenhouse gas emissions are a result of the actions that we all take so, and, but it's also a function of government policy and industry activity. So this actually is a responsibility of all of us. It's a joint responsibility. So we need to take informed and equitable action together. That's how we're going to deal successfully with climate change. Thank you. Great. Thank you uh, so much, Mark, um, for that cogent, concise and clear-sighted update on the climate science. I think um, most of us in this Zoom room would feel sobered by this message of yours, that the more we know, the worse it looks. But we also, um, I imagine, will have some interesting discussion about what you've shown us about the clear choices before us and the timeframes um, that we need to be thinking on. So thanks again. It's now my um, great pleasure to introduce our second speaker, um, Professor Ove Hergelberg. Um, Ove is a professor of marine studies at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, 
Um, Ove's research focuses on the impacts of global change on marine ecosystems and is one of the most cited authors on climate change. In addition to pursuing scientific discovery, Ove has had a 20 year history in leading research organisations, including um, the Centre for Marine Studies and the Global Institute, both at the University of Queensland. So looking forward to your presentation and thanks over to you, Ove. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Uh, can you see my first slide? Yes, yeah, thank you. That's a miracle, great. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, um, uh, Mark and Lemis and Rebecca for sort of uh, getting this going. I think it's really a great forum. I'd also like to uh, start by recognizing the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet and pay respects to their elders, past, present and, and emerging. And I think as Mark has, um, shown us Australia's climate is changing and, and in some very worrying ways. And what I'm gonna spend 10 minutes on here is, is on the ocean, uh, which is a big part of the climate system, but is also undergoing a, a lot of change. Now the ocean originally was a bit of an enigma because um, when, when people were studying climate change and then sort of approaching the ocean as, a, as, a, as part of the system, they felt that climate change would have very low impacts because of the huge volume, you know, there's half a billion square kilometres of, of water in the oceans. Uh, and the fact that it's very thermally inert, it takes a lot of energy to, to cause uh, water to change temperature. And for that reason, it was sort of just, um, you know, overlooked, I guess, is what you'd say by sort of um, some of the first reports coming from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But the real, um, I guess the, the reason for this uh, is that um, if you assume the oceans are uh, mixing, then of course you don't think it's, it's, it's going to change by much because the temperature is diluted out and so on. It was only when uh, people realised more and more that the fact that the surface ocean wasn't mixing into the, um, the main bulk of the ocean, that the first 300 metres of where most of the energy that, that has been going, realised that in fact the ocean was poised for, for a lot of change. And that change has been caught um, up in, in a number of re recent reports from the IPCC. Uh, the first one at AR5, which Mark mentioned, uh, has about three uh, chapters devoted to the oceans as systems uh, uh, and so on. And then more recently, um, the uh, um, report coming, a special report on the ocean and cryosphere. And, what these two reports uh, tell us is that things are changing and dramatically quickly. And some again, some of these have been mentioned by Mark, but I've just sort of taken one of the tables from the, uh, the report in, in, in 2019, the so-called SROC report. And what you're looking at here are two scenarios. You're looking at the, the past, which is a sort of a tan color. And then you're looking at the worst case scenario, which is the pinkish band of, of, of models. Uh, these are futurist, future models. And then the other is the sort of blue color, which is where we would like to be, I guess, at RCP 2.6, which is somewhat uh, around the sort of 1.5 uh, way below two degree sort of uh, area. And what we're seeing is that today, things are already demonstrably hotter. There are more heat waves. We're having a, a dramatic loss of ice sheets, uh, again, ahead of schedule. We're, we have rising seas that Mark talked about, uh, the loss of oxygen, acidification due to the direct effect of CO2 and so on. So we've got all of these things going on. It's not surprising then that we're seeing some really fundamental changes in the, the, the biological aspects of, of the ocean. And this is really a graphic to capture an enormous amount of literature. Uh, what we're seeing is declining fisheries, uh, impacts on um, you know, the ability to sort of get hatchlings, you know, oysters, uh, un unraveling ecosystems, things like coral reefs are disappearing. We have species shifting at, you know, sort of 15 kilometers a year um, towards uh, poleward uh, regions and so on. Uh, a loss of so on. dramatic changes going on uh, in uh, the ocean. As well as that, we're seeing um, very um, important changes to the sort of survivorship of a, a range of key, um, uh, key uh, habitat types. And 
These are things like coral reefs, seagrasses, and kelp, which are often referred to as a sort of ecosystem engineers. They create habitat for an incredible uh, number of species. Coral reefs are something like 100 times that of a temperate, temperate area. We're seeing sort of kelp forests that harvest, um, that, that, that harbor an enormous biodiversity as well. When you put those up against um, uh, the information on uh, how uh, heat waves are changing, and this is this figure from SMAL in 2019, you can see that as we have uh, lengthened the, um, uh, the, 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 the length of, of heat waves, we have now started to collapse these uh, ecosystems. And my own experience over the years has been with um, coral reefs, and I can tell you it's been a dramatic ride uh, going from um, studies that I began in the 1980s where we didn't have mass mortality of corals uh, to today, where over the last five years we've had three major uh, mass coral bleaching events. And these events have, um, you know, if you look at these figures here, uh, you're, you're talking about sort of, you know, thousands of, of miles of, of, of coral reef. In this case, in 2016, when the first of these massive uh, record events happened, uh, there was about 30% of shallow water corals that were killed. Again, back to back. Um, in 2017, another 20% of, of shallow water corals disappeared. And in 2020, uh, we saw another 20% of, of corals disappear. And so it's these, these types of numbers, I guess, and images like this, which is from the Great Barrier Reef. This is the effect of, of two degrees above the sort of summer maxima for about six weeks. So it's a really sort of mild heat wave by our standards. Uh, but has a huge impact. And of course, the issue here is that, you know, what's going to happen in the future? And, and you know, it doesn't take much to, to, to take a graph like this to relate this back to the impact on, on heat waves and to come to the conclusion that as we go forward, we're going to see less and less, you know, of, of coral dominated systems. And in fact, um, a special report done on 1.5 degrees Celsius by the I IPCC um, collated uh, the data on, on coral reefs, the multiple lines of evidence suggested that even if we strike hard at the problem and, um, and, 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 and get uh, flatten the curve to, to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we'll still lose 70 to 90 percent of today's corals. And then if we go to two degrees, we've literally got about one percent of what we had today uh, uh, um, you know, still on reef re systems. And so this is really, uh, you know, not only uh, an amazing scientific, uh, terrifying fact, but it also has enormous implications for the many uh, millions of people um, that depend on coral reefs uh, for their food and livelihoods. And this is just one example, the tourist industry on the Great Barrier Reef, worth around five to six billion years, oh, sorry, billion, um, a billion per year. And so these are massive costs. And of course, COVID taught us that these changes, um, these, these changes in the access or the economic structure have huge impacts on people's lives. And so that's just really um, to, to add gloom to gloom, unfortunately, but I guess this is a truthful session. Uh, the, these are really worrying uh, changes. I wanna just, talk a little bit about commitment in the final couple, couple of minutes here. Um, Mark talked about uh, the rate of sea level rise. Uh, and I note that we were going off uh, uh, values coming from AR5 at 3.3 millimeters per year. Uh, he talked about 3.6 millimeters per year. We're seeing this massive change that, so by the end of century, we will be somewhere between sort of 60 and 100 centimeters of sea level rise. And you might say, well, yeah, that's something we, we can actually engineer around and so on and so forth. And of course, this is where the long-term commitments of things like ocean acidification and sea level rise. Uh, this is a, a whole series of models out to 2300, you know, several centuries away. And what you're seeing is that across those different models that were quite reasonable when we talk about, you know, the century, uh, about meters upon meters of sea level rise. And we're committed to this. And of course, this becomes a, not only a sort of an engineering and science issue, it becomes a moral issue about whether or not we should be uh, committing um, future generations to 
what can only be seen as a, a very tough situation that gets worse. Of course, you don't have to look far in Queensland to really understand some of the impacts of, of uh, and real and potential impacts of sea level rise. And this is just a couple of things from the Gold Coast. On the left-hand side here, you have inundation maps for the Gold Coast uh, at uh, you know, RCP 4.5, end of century. And you're seeing a really large number of those areas uh, flooding and being um, destroyed, essentially. Um, and, and, I, and I guess when you look then at um, the interaction between storms and sea level rise, and you start to look at where people build and so on, it's really uh, a major issue that we are facing potentially billions upon billions of dollars in terms of lost infrastructure by 2100. And this particular study on the right hand side done by NCARF um, now uh, over a decade ago uh, really needs updating because I think these numbers really make that argument that if we don't deal with this problem and we don't really estimate the true costs, then we really will have a world in which will be very hard to, 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 to live. And so I'll pass it over to Justine uh, who will talk further about this issue. Wonderful. Um, everyone see me okay? Lamise, shall I keep going? Can you see me, Ove? I can see you. Okay, great. Um, must be my view. Thank you so much, um, as you say, for, for speaking these difficult truths with um, rigour and clarity about um, the oceans and coastlines that affect us um, and for bringing not just the story of the scale of loss, um, drawing on your um, multiple decades of experience, but um, showing us the stakes and raising the moral questions that follow. Uh, can I just give you a quick reminder uh, before we move to our next speaker that you're welcome to vote on any questions coming up in the Q&A that um, are of interest to you. That will help me with moderation at the end. But without any further ado, it's my great pleasure um, to introduce our next speaker, also from the University of Queensland, Associate Professor Justine Bell um, is here with us um, from the Law School. She teaches undergraduate and postgraduate courses in environmental law and also property law. Uh, Justine's current research focuses on legal mechanisms for protection of the coast under climate change, incorporating both human settlements and coastal ecosystems. Justine uh, is leading an ARC project uh, currently, considering how wetland ecosystems can be integrated into our legal frameworks. And she's particularly interested in how the law can facilitate blue carbon projects here in Australia and internationally. So looking forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Christine. Thanks for that. Uh, and Ove, you're right to drive my PowerPoints, I hope. <laughs> so as Ove talked about in his talk, um, and I think Mark touched on it a bit as well, the current policy trajectory that we're on is not going to get us really in the vicinity of that 1.5 to two degree targets that, that we really need. Uh, and even if we did hit two degrees of warming, it's going to result in really significant environmental change. So we do need to be thinking a lot about climate change adaptation and how um, we can respond to this climate change that we're likely to see. So what I'd like to do in the, the fairly short period of time I have tonight is talk uh, holistically, I suppose, about how law can respond to these challenges. And some of this might be fairly basic information for some of our audience. But what I'd like to spend more time focusing on is some of the, the key developments that have occurred in Queensland in the past year or so, mainly in the adaptation space, but also touching on the mitigation space as well. Uh, so over if you could just move to the next slide, please. Thank you. Oh, sorry, you might need to click through those photos, I'm not sure what's happened there. There we go, thank you. Uh, so in Australia, a majority of decisions regarding adaptation falls within the jurisdiction of state and local governments, so within the realm of land use planning, um, particularly regarding decisions on future development in areas at risk of, of climate change hazards like sea level rise or bushfire or flood. And in the law and policy space, you could say 
you know, it's a very broad overview. There are four different approaches that a government could take to deal with climate change adaptation, particularly in new developments. Uh, so you could look to avoid the develop, uh, avoid the risk rather by not developing an area, which is one of the photos that we've got there. Uh, you could look at um, trying to accommodate the risk. So we've got a lot of houses in Queensland, for example, in the aftermath of the floods from 10 years ago that have been raised to above uh, potential flood levels in the future with the idea that it can accommodate flood waters. Uh, defence, so you can use various hard and soft structures, either human-made or natural to try and defend against risk, or you can look at uh, retreat measures, so allowing for development to occur in the short term, but making sure that there's some sort of legal mechanism in place to ensure that that retreat happens um, as, as risks are likely to materialise. Uh, next slide, please, Ove. So adaptation policy in Queensland. Um, Queensland has a really complicated history of adaptation planning for sea level rise in particular. And it's something that's been quite politically difficult to get good policy on over the past um, more than a decade. So starting, I think, in about 2007 or 8, um, through to 2009, the Bly government tried really hard to get some fairly robust sea level rise policy in place. Uh, but we met with some pretty significant opposition from the property and development sectors. So it was quite difficult to get that policy in place. Uh, there was a policy that was introduced very shortly before the 2012 election when the Newman government came into power. Uh, and that policy was stripped back fairly quickly upon them taking office. And then once the Palaszczuk government came into power, uh, it took them quite a while to get the momentum going again for sea level rise policy. So it's really only since this state planning policy I've referenced here in 2017 that we've had um, some really strong policy about sea level rise planning in Queensland and that we've had that period of policy stability sufficient that local governments can start making decisions pursuant to it uh, and start integrating it into local government planning schemes. So in Queensland we have the Climate Adaptation Strategy which is a very high level policy document that sets out general statements of intent and then we've got the more specific state planning policy, which applies to local governments if they're making or amending a planning scheme, or if they're assessing a development application where they haven't yet integrated it into their planning scheme. And the state planning policy states an intent to ensure that natural hazards such as flood are taken into account in planning decisions in order to reduce the burden on government and communities in the future. So I think it's important to acknowledge we do have a really big legacy of development already in at-risk areas, which I think Gove mentioned right towards the end of his talk. Uh, so looking at drawing that line in the sand and limiting the risk to what we've already got at this, period, at this point in time. So the starting point for new proposed development pursuant to the state planning policy is that it avoids these natural hazard areas and it's linked to maps of, of natural hazard areas or where this is not possible, it mitigates the risk to people and property to an acceptable or tolerable level. So for example, if you have a proposed development site that might be subject to floods, uh, I guess one option is to avoid it and not develop it. Another option would be to accommodate it by elevating it on stilts so that the habitable areas are located above the proposed flood level. And this could then reduce that risk to an acceptable level. So as I said, we've had this period of policy stability now in Queensland. And so we are seeing the state planning policy translating into some better planning decisions. So for example, there was a recent case before the Planning Environment Court uh, just last year, which was an appeal against a refusal of a development permit to turn a site uh, at Fernvale in Queensland into 99 lots for relocatable homes. So it was, um, I guess really intensifying uh, the population that would be on this rather large parcel of land. And it's in a mapped flood hazard area at the state level. There was a lot of evidence led before the court that said this was actually a really good site for this sort of development. Uh, there was a rapidly aging population. It was the type of um, relocatable home park that would really suit the demographics of the area, although potentially more over the medium term than the short term. So the court weighed this up in, in making their assessment, but ultimately upheld the refusal of the development as it did not comply with the state planning policy. 
So it did not make adequate allowance for flooding to be exacerbated by climate change, and it did not mitigate that risk to an acceptable or tolerable level. Uh, so that's just, um, I suppose, one of the examples that we've seen recently of development refusals being upheld uh, on the basis of climate change. So hopefully now we've got that policy stability, we'll start seeing these sorts of decisions being made. And I think, as, as Mark said, we're in a space now where the impacts of climate change and the sciences is pretty well known and governments have very good information. And Mark said that some of the science we're dealing with now, it's, it's pretty old science, it's old news, and we've known it for quite some time. So we really need to have governments making good decisions based on, on the science that they have available. And I think the other space where we're going to see a lot of litigation into the future is as climate change impacts materialize and uh, we start to see impacts of, of climate change causing economic loss and property damage to people, we're going to see actions like um, negligence claims against governments for things like negligent approvals of development, negligent location of infrastructure, that sort of thing. And uh, the sort of things that courts will look at in making assessments of negligence liability will depend on what information the government had before them. Um, whether they were constrained in, in their resources, whether they didn't have the information, that might be something they could use as a defence. But if you've got a situation where the government does have all of this really good information, but they're choosing not to act on it, um, that's a situation that is probably not going to be good in terms of the outcome for liability. So that's a big space to watch into the future. Next slide, please, Rob. So that's looking at human settlements and the, the other aspect of my talk uh, that I was asked to speak about tonight is looking at protecting coastal ecosystems under sea level rise. So if we think about ecosystems like mangroves, for example, they offer enormous benefits to society from an ecosystem services perspective. So they're really important stores of carbon dioxide, they stabilise shorelines, they act as habitat for fisheries and they provide water filtration services. And uh, Ecosystems like mangroves in particular exist in this really um, contentious area from a legal perspective, which is the intertidal zone where the boundaries between public and private land are often a little bit blurry. And um, the other thing that we know about these ecosystems is that as sea levels rise, this intertidal zone can move inland and coastal ecosystems have the capacity to migrate with that shoreline. So ecosystems like mangroves can actually keep pace with sea level rise uh, and move further inland. But if there are physical structures present that prevent them from doing that, then ecosystems and all of their benefits are lost. So if there's a seawall, um, if there's some sort of fencing, if there's other sorts of infrastructure, then they'll be squeezed out uh, of the landscape. So a really big challenge for for governments and planners is making sure that space is available for ecosystems to migrate into into the future. Uh, so one way to do this is to zone land as being required for future migration, which is something that we haven't done too much of in Queensland yet. Uh, something I've been spending a lot of time looking at is uh, whether you can have arrangements in place between landholders and government, for example, to progressively move their land use back over time to balance beneficial use of land in the short term with ecosystem protection in the long term. So making sure that um, productive use of land isn't lost immediately because it might not be required to be lost immediately, but making sure that there's that space in the future for ecosystems to, um, to move forward. And I think our next speaker might talk a little bit about Queensland's Land Restoration Fund, which is facilitating some projects of that type. Uh, and just the next slide, please, Ove. The last thing I'd just like to, to fairly briefly mention, because it is a really big and important development that occurred in Queensland last year, uh, was the commencement of our Human Rights Act, which commenced on the 1st of January 2020. And we now join Victoria and the ACT as the third Australian state to legislate for the protection of human rights. So internationally, the link between unabated climate change and human rights is very well known. And human rights law and policy has influenced climate policy in other countries. And there's also been a very strong trend of using international and domestic human rights legislation uh, to bring actions uh, on climate change grounds before courts. And some of these have been very successful, like the agenda case in the Netherlands, for example. So 
uh, the ACT in Victoria, as I said, already have human rights legislation, but they haven't really been utilised for climate change purposes. But the Queensland Act came into force at this really, I think, critical juncture where um, a lot of momentum was building overseas about the links between climate change and human rights. And I think we're really reaching a bit of a pressure point in Queensland in terms of some of the major mining developments in particular that were being approved. And uh, this rising interest in Queensland has actually led to a court case that is going to be heard by Queensland's land court this year. Uh, so it's an objection to the proposed Waratah coal mine on a number of grounds, including incompatibility with Queensland's Human Rights Act. So the objectors are alleging that the Queensland government's plan to issue a mining lease and an environmental authority to Waratah coal limits human rights, including the right to life, the rights of the child, uh, the rights of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and the rights to freedom from discrimination. So the full case will be heard later this year, but it's already passed some really significant hurdles before the court um, on some various jurisdictional grounds. And I think this case really just scratches the surface of the potential for human rights legislation in Australia to drive climate change action. So if we link it back to that sea level rise context, uh, internationally, it's been observed that climate threats like sea level rise will impact on a number of human rights. Uh, and many of these rights are present in the Australian domestic context as well. So there could be arguments made into the future that state governments, for example, need to act on sea level rise threats in order to fulfil their obligations under human rights legislation. So uh, as somebody who's you know, been an environmental and climate lawyer for a while now, the Human Rights Act is probably the most exciting thing that I think has happened in terms of the potential for, for driving climate action in Queensland and in other states as well. So I think I'll, I'll leave it on that positive note for tonight. So thank you. Brilliant. Thanks so much, uh, Justine, for um, bringing uh, the quest the, these global questions of uh, climate science and marine science um, to our coastal and settlement um, uh, planning and legal institutions, which are sure to be tested in very interesting ways. It's nice to know that there are clever minds like yours watching um, these cases um, surrounding potential development refusals on the basis of climate adaptation policy, climate science, and, and these stories about um, this potential for human rights considerations to be developed um, all the better. Um, it's my great pleasure to move to our final speaker for tonight. Um, so Georgine rudin Reese is the Executive Director of the Climate Change and Sustainable Futures Branch at the Queensland Department of Environment and Science. Georgine is a lawyer by training with technical expertise in climate and energy policy. In her 20-year career, she's been driving and participating in energy and climate action projects and policy at the executive level, both here um, and New Zealand, as well as in the Middle East across public and private sectors, um, including in energy firms, Origin Energy and BP. Since Georgine uh, joined government, uh, she's led delivery of the Queensland climate change response in 2017 and has been instrumental in the delivery of the Palaszczuk government's $500 million land restoration fund, the $500 million workers, million dollar workers assistance package and the $200 million future skills fund. Georgine is currently responsible for delivering the Queensland Climate Action Plan uh, 2020 to 23. So looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Georgine. Thanks so much, Beck. And I might just, um, uh, I presume everyone can hear me. So please let me know if I'm talking to myself. But um, I'm just going to share my screen as well. Sounds great, thanks. Great, no worries. Um, and let me put that on there just into, sorry, it gets very slow. Um, great, so thanks, thanks very much, Beck, and um, fantastic to be here. Um, um, you know, from a very rainy uh, Queensland, I'm sure everyone online is sort of in a very similar environment. Um, look, if I can also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, from the lands on which I'm coming to you from, 
uh, which is Brisbane, and um, that is the land of the Turrbal and Yagara people. Um, so paying my respects to them and, and to elders from First Nations people all across Queensland. Um, if I could thank the UQ and the UQ and the ANU for um, hosting this evening, um, and if I can also acknowledge um, Griffith University, the Climate Action Beacon, where I'm an executive in residence um, and uh, involved in a number of partnerships there. Um, so just um, uh, let me just give a little bit of, um, I guess, historical context to Queensland's uh, policy position. Um, as mentioned, we did release a Queensland climate change response in 2017, uh, which was two documents, a Queensland climate transition strategy and a Queensland climate adaptation strategy. Those um, strategies um, have um, sort of led rise to a number of programs being developed in Queensland. Uh, if, if I talk about the adaptation side, um, certainly in local government, uh, in, in, in adaptation and, and climate change risk management uh, and state government um, to the science that we've delivered um, on the, the QCTS side, sorry, the Queensland Climate Transition Strategy, the 50% renewable energy target was one of the key commitments. But that those documents, to some extent, um, had um, had their life. They were high-level documents, and the view is very much that a refreshed uh, policy response was required, and, and hence a climate action plan 2020-2030 uh, was proposed at the last election, which was late last year. And you know that that uh, sort of election intent is in response to. Um, reports such as this Deloitte Access Economics report that was released late last year, which really starts to pin the tail on the donkey in relation to defining the costs associated with climate change and really um, finally provides us with that cost of inaction. Uh, some of you will appreciate that when um, departments like mine talk about the action required to meet our zero net emissions targets, we're often met with the question of, well, how much is that going to cost? What we've never been able to do in the past is really to say, well, this is the cost if you don't do it. And, you know, th this modelling that uh, Deloitte um, produced late last year uh, has really started to allow us to, I guess, answer that question. So while we can't sort of, you can certainly quantify the cost of action, um, but really being able to say what happens if you don't do it is, is very, very powerful. And in the case of Queensland, uh, unfortunately, we are in that wonderful position of having so much to gain, but so much to potentially lose. Um, and so if, if I take you through these, these numbers, zero net emissions by 2050 in 2070, um, it's a positive story of economic growth if, if global um, Paris commitments are met. 5% um, growth, over 185,000 uh, 185, jobs added. On the flip side, if there's no action, uh, so this is under a worst case uh, climate scenario, significant hits to um, state uh, GSP, um, significant hits to employment, and the industry's hardest hit uh, will come as no surprise. They're almost the same industries uh, that were hit by COVID. And in fact, under the Deloitte scenarios, uh, if there is no action, um, you know, tangible action on climate change, then the costs of this become a COVID year on year um, from about 2040. So significant drivers for action. Um, and I do apologise, the, the formatting of this slide isn't particularly pretty, but what, what Queensland is, is focused on is, is doing three things well. Um, I think you'll see from those numbers that um, we are, um, this is on a per capita basis, but Queensland uh, is a very high emitter. Um, we are the largest in, in, in whole terms. We are the largest percentage of emissions in Australia um, on the 2018 figures. And since 2005, we've reduced our emissions by about 8.3%. Um, but other states, New South Wales and Victoria, have managed to reduce those emissions by around 17. So we are lagging in relation to our emissions reduction. If you look at our sources, you can see where the challenge lies. It's, it's, it's predominantly in um, electricity, um, which means that the renewable energy target becomes critical. 
You'll also see that large number for fugitive emissions. Those fugitive emissions are largely from only a couple of mine sites in the Denison Trough. Um, the land use figure, um, as you'll be aware, um, we uh, certainly the Labor government, uh, when they came into power a number of years ago now, uh, reversed the land clearing laws um, to, to, to try and minimise land clearing, and that will, will ultimately have some impact. But there's a range of things we have to do. Um, you know, the uh, Queensland has been um, caught in the crosshairs of, you know, a, a, a fairly difficult political debate. And that debate is between climate action and the, the, um, the safety of jobs in, in traditional industries. And, you know, those, those issues are very, very real. And, you know, more work needs to be done to ensure that people who currently are earning a living from um, high carbon jobs are assured a pathway to, um, you know, the new low carbon economy that's in all of our benefits. So, you know, work has to be done on, on building those low carbon jobs for the future. Of course, we need to reduce emissions across the economy. And importantly, we need to make sure that we have the right science and we can get the science into the hands of decision makers. Um, so that's a critical focus for, for Queensland. I think it's worth noting and, and really, you know, I'm just making some high level points here about creating the jobs of the future. Um, Queensland has done a lot of work in um, uh, certainly developing a series of roadmaps to, to set the path, you know, whether that's the Biofutures roadmap, uh, the Advanced Manufacturing Roadmap, uh, Queensland Hydrogen Industry Strategies, um, Advanced Resource Recovery um, Industry Strategies, um, $2 billion worth of green bonds have been uh, released. Um, a lot of work, I guess, has been done to um, attract and invest in Industry 4.0. Um, Place-based policy we know will be absolutely key for, for the points that I've made. Um, certainly, uh, my department has, has run an extraordinary program called uh, Communities in Transition um, in collaboration with USQ and JCU where we took six uh, major regional communities um, through a facilitated discussion over a couple of years to really talk about, you know, global megatrends and where they're going and how they, how they feel in light of that information and what their values and strengths might be and how they might prevail um, going forward. Um, Clean Growth Choices is the name of the consortium that ran that program and, and I would urge you to look at the website there. There's some extraordinary, um, business cases that have been developed by those regions. Um, Bark Holden uh, in the outback is, is a real, um, um, a really exciting story where Ross Garno is very involved with the Bark Holden community, um, developing a, a sort of a circular economy vision uh, for their future. That's just one example. Certainly um, at the last election, uh, the government uh, developed and uh, launched a, a $200 million future skills fund that's very much about building pathways um, against a range of mega trends. Uh, certainly, if you look at some of our traditional industries, they're already being disrupted by um, digitization and automation. Um, global decarbonisation is coming in on top of that. And, um, you know, it's really identifying who's at risk and, and thinking about the, the skilling pathways required to assist um, uh, those, those workers um, into the new economy. And then of course, um, skills investment um, for industry 4.0 and, and certainly Queensland has opened a range of centres for um, reskilling in hydrogen and also renewable energy. So a, a range of things that have been done there. Please excuse me, I'm gonna wave my arms around because my lights have gone off. Um, they probably won't come back on. Um, in relation to reducing emissions across the economy, um, a, a huge um, a, amount of work here but probably um, the thing to say is that the scale of, of these initiatives probably hasn't yet been reached, but certainly the foundations are there for um, some fantastic work. Um, obviously the 50% renewable energy target needs to be met. Um, that will be um, significantly enhanced um, through the, the development of renewable energy zones and three are mooted across Queensland. The establishment of Clean Co um, as a clean energy generator, publicly owned generator, um, is an important initiative. Renewable Energy Fund, which is, sits with Queensland Investment Corporation, Copper String, a big um, uh, clean energy schools program, 
the waste levy that was introduced a couple of years ago that will fund a number of these initiatives, um, circular economy labs, you know, which is working with regions to develop um, circular economy industries, and the, the land restoration fund, which is a landmark um, carbon farming um, initiative um, involving the agricultural sector um, and, and really encouraging that sector to get involved in um, the development of um, soil carbon and carbon credits in a, in a range of methodologies, but also to encourage the co-benefits, the biodiversity, the regenerative agriculture and all of those fantastic um, sort of positive outcomes that can come from um, sort of rethinking um, how we farm. Um, getting to um, what, you know, traditionally known as adaptation, but we are really taking a risk um, sort of focus, I guess, in Queensland. The strong evidence base is critical and um, Queensland has invested heavily in the science as a lot of the states have um, and has a, a, a very good resource. Um, it's one thing to have the resource though, and I think the next challenge for government is how do we get that science into the hands of people who are making decisions every day on infrastructure, um, on you know, building, um, planning, et cetera, et cetera, um, so that we know that those, uh, that science is being fully integrated. Um, as I mentioned, the, the councils, I think, in Queensland are, are probably leading the way. Um, we have the um, LGAQ here leading uh, the Queensland Climate Resilient Councils Program. They've developed a climate risk management framework for local government that's being trialled and piloted at the moment, um, and 46 of Queensland's councils are involved in that program. Uh, we've also got a coastal program that, that the coastal um, councils have been involved in and, you know, I think 22 councils have uh, climate um, hazard adaptation strategies. Um, so terrific work from the local government sector. State government has been working with Griffith University um, to build capability for um, public servants to understand how every decision they make is impacted by climate change and, and, and how um, how they are part of the solution here. Um, and the unpacking of that risk for government is, is, is complex and the building of that capability is, is, is significant. Um, but, but it is ongoing and, and the work is being done there. Um, I think the next thing we would hope to reach is of course um, a, a whole of government climate risk framework for the Queensland government um, and, and those conversations are, are in, in train now. And then of course the investment to ensure that uh, those risks are being managed and you know this this continues to be a challenge um, uh, in a um, uh, in a debt recovery um, sort of position that the Queensland government is in at the moment where it's uh, in a debt and savings um, position so really um, not making huge amounts of money available for for that investment but that will come in time um, look I might leave it there. I had a couple of links that I can put in the chat. Um, some, one of those was to the science, one was to the LGAQ work, and also one was to our newsletter, which has just been released and, uh, and, and can keep you in touch with um, some pretty amazing things happening around Queensland. Um, um, it's, it's, it's surprising the, the amount of activity that is happening in this state, um, where I think we're probably traditionally seen as um, perhaps not being as open to, to climate action as others, but um, I think uh, when you have a look in that newsletter, uh, you know, it, it, it might give you a different perspective. I might um, stop there, um, Beck, and, and hand back to the discussion. Okay. Thank you so much, Georgine. I think um, it's really interesting to see state and local um, government bodies um, at the forefront of both our climate mitigation and ad adaptation planning um, as public service providers, utility and infrastructure um, uh, providers and more and very interesting points about the future of work um, in a changing climate. So hope we get some interesting questions for you. What I wanted to do um, to start off with, I know we've got this um, uh, Zoom-based democracy of questions, but I thought I'd use my moderator's power to actually put forward um, the first two climate science questions first and then move to the bigger question that everyone would like to hear um, on a slightly more popular basis from Oscar. So the first two, if, if I can put these um, 
uh, to Mark and Ove. We have a comment um, uh, that it would be good to get a reply on from Associate Professor Andrew Glickson querying um, the 1.5 degree target and the fact that temperature rise on continents is already above um, that estimate um, and that it's 2.3 degrees higher in the Arctic. And if I can collect that with the other question below from Janet Ellis, um, she's asking how much weight do the IPC give to tipping points how are they included in IPCC models and how much could they um, increase temperatures and how quickly on a global scale? Uh, so I imagine Mark wants to speak to that, uh, but if you do over as well, that'd be great. Sure. Um, th thanks, Becca. A, a real quick answer because there's not much time and probably lots of questions. Um, so, so in terms of the 1.5 degrees, um, that's very well known. So, for example, that was one of the, the sort of key messages from the IPCC's Climate Change and Land Report. And uh, the, the importance is that the Paris Agreement is a global temperature, which, which has both the land and the ocean um, put together. So um, we know that the land is heating up quicker than the oceans. The oceans can bury um, a lot of heat deep down. Um, the land can't do that. And so the land is heating up a lot quicker. Um, and also we get other processes like evaporation happening more over oceans than land. And so, so we get a different surface temperature response on land and over oceans. But, um, but the, the key thing is when we look at the global temperature, that's the combined land and ocean temperature, we're at 1.24 and likely to exceed 1.5 degrees in the very near future on a year by year basis, not on an average basis. In terms of tipping points, um, the, the climate change models, um, well, which, which are really Earth system models uh, that are currently used, do sort of include some aspects of tipping points um, through um, what they deal with in the sense of there's feedbacks which operate in the models. The whole point of using a model is actually to incorporate feedbacks. So you get the feedback from say evaporation into um, changes in cloud, which changes the radiation budget of the earth, which then changes the, um, the, the energy budget and the evaporation, et cetera. So you get those sort of feedbacks around the place. So, so feedbacks are normal in models. Um, uh, they, they don't necessarily deal with the full array of topics that are often addressed with um, people dealing with tipping points. And, you know, so for example, uh, changes in fires, because fires are a function both of the physical drivers, but also of human drivers, such as ignition sources and things like that. So, so the answer is um, there's, a, there's a good understanding of the 1.5 and, and a growing understanding of the tipping point or feedback uh, elements. Yes, I agree. I short, sharp, concise. Um, thank you very much. Oh. Why don't we move to this um, bigger, more uh, far reaching question from Oscar Metcalf. Thank you for this. Um, and, and, and bring in Georgine um, and Justine uh, and anyone else on the panel who's keen to engage. So Oscar says adaptation and mitigation are often approached on a sectoral basis. However, climate presents a cross-sectoral risk, um, opportunities and trade-offs. To what extent are our governance structures adequate to this cross-sectoral challenge? Um, and where adequate, what is needed? Are there jurisdictions that you um, see um, matching uh, where the governance matches the complexity of the challenges within the limits of their agency. Are we up for the task and where? Who would like to start us off? Uh, Georgine, you're, you're unmuted. I am. <laughs> My mistake. <That's> already... <laughs> um, look, um, it is a challenge. Um, and I think um, COVID is helping um, because I think it has, um, in, in a funny sort of way, uh, because it has put a real focus on supply chains and how supply and chains are often consistent across se sectors. Um, and so I think um, sectors are, are starting to see where they have points of common interest, uh, which is useful. Um, however, um, you know, I think if, if you look at the structure of government uh, where those sectors are siloed off under different agencies, it is very difficult to get that um, cross-sectoral approach. 
Um, I think uh, certainly in Queensland, under the adaptation strategy work that we had done, uh, there was a cross-sectoral approach that was taken. Uh, and, and when we talk about climate risk in that broader sort of framing, more TCFD framing, where you're simply talking about physical um, transition and, and legal liability risk combined, it, it starts to be easier to talk about how, how that cuts um, across sectors. Um, so I think we have seen um, some efforts um, to, to, to try and address this, but I think the system is very clunky. Some of the jurisdictions where you see it done better is when they've started amalgamating agencies that can assist each other. I mean, the hierarchy of government is a very real thing. And I'm telling you, the Department of Environment and Science does not sit at the top of that hierarchy. Um, and, and, and so really the conflict of interest is, is negotiated through that hierarchy. And that's very important to remember. Um, so where you see agencies such as New South Wales that start to put environment and planning and energy together, that is starting to create an equal hierarchy between those issues, which allows you to talk far more cross-sectorally about these things. And I think it's, it's, it, it is a key to success. I might stop there and allow others to contribute. Thank you. Justine, would you like to take on? Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a great question. It's a very curly question. And, you know, I think, as, as I said in my talk, we've just had so much political instability that it's been difficult to get, um, you know, enduring policy just, just in one sector. So trying to get that real um, cross-sector stuff, as important as it is, I think we are a little way away from it. And I think... Um, there's a, a few more questions that I've, I've noticed here that talk a little bit about mining in Queensland. And it, it really is the elephant in the room, isn't it, when we talk about things like adaptation policy and, um, and human rights and the Land Restoration Fund and this other great stuff that's happening while we're still approving these, these mega mines that'll be some of the biggest emitters in the world. So I think that's, that's where we really need to be putting our efforts, thinking about how to address all of these problems together. Um, rather than looking at things on a sectoral basis. So I don't have an answer to ask his question, but I think it's a really good one. And I think it's something we need to think about. Yeah. So, so Beck, no, I'll have a quick go at that one as well. Um, like a great question from Oscar. Um, I'd, I'd actually add to that. I'd say it's not only that there's challenges in terms of developing cross-sectoral sort of uh, analysis, um, but it's also challenges in integrating the adaptation and the mitigation agenda. And so, so they tend to be um, kept separate. Um, there's also challenges in terms of uh, dealing with the multiple dimensions of climate change. Um, uh, so, so when you're actually looking at change processes, there's psychological and many other dimensions of climate change which need to be um, dealt with. And so, so that element of integration um, is, is probably not done to the extent that is is uh, desirable or, or needed for you know informed and equitable decision making. One approach to dealing with this is using sort of place-based analysis, so sort of regional case studies or community case studies where you can actually start to look at those sorts of trade-offs and those sorts of responses. And, and when done well, I think that generates quite a groundswell of, of really good sets of responses which are informed and equitable and forward-looking. Great, thanks. Um, I might just uh, pick up the related question from Sarah Hillman at this point, um, because it, it, it presses us a little further on this question of cross-sectoral governance, complexity, and the thorny issue of um, mining uh, approvals being at odds um, with uh, um, the evidence around climate change and other policies. Justine, uh, Georgine, I should say, you mentioned at the end of your response to um, Oscar um, about things working well when climate, energy um, and planning come together. And of course, we know that there are COAG implications here and, um, and other levels of governance to consider. I was wondering if you wanted to say a little more on Queensland renewable energy transition or any other, um, anything else you wanted to say about mining, energy, planning and integrative um, governance? Sure, I mean, I think um, there's a, f a few things, I guess, in, in, in forming the agenda at the moment. I mean, we we certainly did some work uh, looking uh, in, in Queensland. It was it was a little while back now, but it was important work um, 
it was the work we did with EY and it was on sort of risks and opportunities in a zero net emissions uh, world. So essentially what we were trying to do is, is paint the picture for uh, what would the Queensland uh, economy look like under a zero net emissions um, scenario. And, and, and some of that was about uh, that when, when there are so many multiple possible futures, um, but where you have competing interests, if, if people believe, if people don't have a sense of, a, a collective sense of what that can future can be, then all they know is that they probably want to block somebody else's version of that future, if that makes sense. So I don't know what that future looks like. I, I might be in the resources sector. I don't know what that future looks like. I don't have a clear idea. I feel threatened by it. But I know that the Department of Environment Science, for example, might have a, have a view of that, and I know I don't want what they want. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, so I'm going to block. I'm going to assume I know what that is, and I'm going to block that. And so you you have these competing sort of future scenarios, and you are getting resistance in a conversation, and you, and you don't know why that resistance exists. So what we undertook was a a, a process of, of sort of talking to as many, we, we, the facilitated process of talking to as many people as we could. And where we got to in the end was that the Queensland economy doesn't look that much different than it does today, as in mining is a part of that story, ag is a part of that story, manufacturing is a part of that story. But they are very different sectors than they are today. We're mining different things. We're processing those in different ways. We are growing different things. We are growing in different ways. We're manufacturing different stuff in different places. Um, so it, it was a... It was a, an incredibly useful process to determine that we were all talking about the same thing. And I think over time, you will see that Queensland is acknowledging the transition in the resources sector that needs to occur. And um, it, it's, it's a slow and difficult conversation. But for example, um, you know, there will be a two day energy future summit uh, run by Stanwell and um, um, uh, I'm going to have a mental black, oh, sorry, clean co on, on the future of energy for, for the Gladstone region, for example. The, those discussions are happening all over Queensland and people are trying to find their way to that new economic future. And, and once we have people feeling a sense of security that they're not going to be left behind, then, then I think you will find that the conversation eases about um, mining and, and the future of what we are mining um, in Queensland. I'll, I'll add that contribution. Thank you for that, Georgine. We've, we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, I thought one way to end was, uh, would be with just a few final uh, closing comments from you all, like a, a, a few sentences. And just picking up actually on Glenis Pachulny's question um, about getting the broader public involved. What are you most um, interested in putting to us as positive actions that our listeners um, should take? out there in their um, everyday conversations and potentially to government. Um, and, and sorry to the questions above that that were a little bit more specific, but if, if you'd all like our panelists um, just to give a final closing comment along the kind of positive message line, that'd be great. Beck, choose a panelist. You. you. <laughs> Did you want to go over? Sorry about that. Why not? I, Thank you. I actually think um, just listening to those discussions, I'm really impressed by how much has happened in 10 years in terms of uh, starting to have action on the ground. And I really take that point you had before about the sort of um, getting people sort of on board and excited about, you know, what's going to happen next and, and get rid of the competition between groups. So I think that's actually the key. The key. Uh, to me, there's a really exciting future out there, but it has to be managed by the leadership of the state and the, and the federal system. Uh, but if you can get that right, I think we're in a very wonderful position, very optimistic position. Thank you, Ove. Um, Justine, would you like uh, to sign off next? Um, 
yeah, and I think maybe just picking up on, on what Georgine was saying, I think the comment mentioned we're preaching to the converted, and I think that's the problem that we have had this real us versus them problem in Queensland, that you're on the side of mining and resources and prosperity or, or the environment when really we probably all, all do want the same thing, um, and it's trying to work through those things in a really respectful way that's, that's important, and I think messaging is, is really important. So, yeah, I was really interested in what Georgine had to say about that. Mark? Uh, thanks, Beck. So I, I think we need to learn a little bit from COVID. Um, so when we started out on the, on the COVID journey over a year ago, um, one of the arguments put up was it was either economy or health outcomes. And, and so you had to choose. And they were diametrically opposed in the same way that Georgine was talking about how some of the processes in government are opposed. Yet what we've actually learned from uh, COVID is that it's actually completely the opposite story, is that good health policy and good health outcomes are a prerequisite to good economic outcomes. And so when we look at, across different economies, we see a strong relationship between good health policy and good economic outcomes. And it's the same with climate change. The um, rhetoric for a long time has been it's either climate action or jobs. Choose one or the other. And it's, I would actually argue that that's completely wrong, is that the future for us is dealing with climate change guarantees a strong economy, not dealing with climate change guarantees problems and huge payouts and huge pain for everyone. So we actually need, if we had to go and do something and uh, you know, take an everyday action, um, as was asked in that question, it's actually go out to people and talk about a different um, paradigm. It's actually climate change means jobs. And that's how Biden is talking about it, climate change. When I see climate change, when I talk about climate change, I'm talking jobs. And that's how that's actually being related in the US. We need to adopt that. And to do that, I think we actually need to change the rhetoric from being climate change versus jobs um, and climate change being a cost um, and climate change being a problem to start to change this. It's climate change and jobs. Climate change action is an investment in our future. Climate change actually means a positive outcome for Queensland comparative to what it would alternatively be, even in spite of the fact of grim scenarios. And so I think there's some really good things we can talk about and it's actually taking a proactive stance, which actually gives us new options and new opportunities. Wonderful. Thanks, Mark. Any final comments, Georgie? Look, I think if you want inspiration in Queensland and just to see how the reality is different from the political uh, federal narrative, which all drives us a bit bonkers, um, have a look to the Queensland regions. There is so much inspiring work going on out there. I mean, I was at a, a breakfast on Thursday, I think, uh, where a number of Queensland regional mayors spoke and every one of them positioned their region in the future economy. And they didn't blink in relation to the marriage of traditional and new industries. And they were chasing it as hard as they could. Um, they're inspiring. Um, I think there's, you know, they're the home of circular economy in Queensland, believe it or not, but they're absolutely taking circular economy and want to take it to the next level. So uh, Queensland regions are on board. Don't let anyone tell you any different. And um, and you know, happy to share as many links uh, to to demonstrate that you know there's there's huge support uh, here for a, a really bright and positive future for Queensland. Brilliant. Um, thank you all for such a fantastic panel, and my um, sincere apologies for those people who have excellent questions um, unanswered. I note how many of them are are about this problem of continuing mining approvals. Um, the contradiction with our climate goals and, and related biodiversity and other um, uh, social concerns. Um, so keep the conversations going. Thank you again. Two final announcements from um, uh, the ANU. Um, we have a scholarship. Um, if anyone out there is interested in these in issues and thinking about a PhD at the ANU Institute for Climate, Energy and Disaster Solutions, we've launched um, something called the Game Change Fund, um, and it has the aim of supporting PhD scholars from rural and remote areas. So if you're interested in that, finding out more, there's a um, link in the chat box, I think, 
um, should be visible for you by now. If not, um, I'll make sure it's up before we close this recording. Um, um, and a reminder to all that this event has been recorded and will be available for viewing on um, the ANU Institute's YouTube channel. Thanks again. It's been an absolute pleasure and, and I hope you all stay dry, get some rest um, and walk away with um, good ideas. Thanks. Thanks, Beck. Thanks, Beck. It was great. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Yep, see you, Mike. Cheers, Ove. Oh, oh. <laughs> Cheers, mate. See you. Thanks for involving us. See you. Thanks, Ove.